Miscellaneous Writings. Book 4. Part 7 of 9, of the Live and Times of David. By Charles Henry Mackintosh. Better known as C.H.M. Recording by Irving Res using Digital Voices. Part 7 David's House and the House of God 2 Samuel 7 and 1 Chronicles 29. There is nothing in which the narrowness of the human heart is so manifested as in its apprehensions of divine grace. Legalism is that to which we are most prone, because it gives self a place, and makes it something. Now this is the very thing which God will not allow. No flesh shall glory in his presence, is a decree which can never be reversed. God must be all, fill all, and give all. When the psalmist inquired, What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits? The answer is I will take the cup of salvation. The way to render to God is to take yet more largely from his bounteous hand. To be a thankful, unquestioning recipient of grace glorifies God far more than all we could render to him. The gospel of God's grace comes to man as a ruined, guilty, helpless being. Hence God must be a great actor in redemption. By his counsel alone it was planned, through his mercy alone it was accomplished in the one offering of Jesus Christ once for all and by the Spirit's power alone is the sinner quickened into life and believes the glorious and peace-giving tidings of salvation. Now, this stops man's mouth altogether as to his own righteousness. It excludes boasting, for we cannot boast of what we are but the unworthy recipients. How happy should all this make us! How happy it is to be the subjects of such grace, grace which blots out all our sins, sets the conscience at rest and sanctifies all the affections of the heart. Blessed forever be the fountain from which this saving grace flows to guilty sinners. 2 Samuel 7 is full of instruction as to the great principle of grace. The Lord had done much for his servant David, he had raised him from the depth of obscurity to an exceedingly high elevation, and David felt this, and was disposed to look around him and survey the precious mercies which, in rich profusion, strewed his path. And it came to pass, when the king sat in his house, and the Lord had given him rest round about from all his enemies, that the king said to Nathan the prophet, See now, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells within curtains. Observe. David sat in his house. He was surrounded by his own circumstances, and thought it needful to do something for God. But, again, he was in error as to his thoughts of building a house for Jehovah. The ark was within curtains, truly, because the time had not yet come for it to find a resting place. God had ever moved in the fullest sympathy with his people. When they were plunged in the furnace of Egyptian bondage, he was in the burning bush, when they were treading their long and dreary journey across the burning desert, his chariot traveled in company with them all the way. When they stood beneath the frowning walls of Jericho he was there as a man of war, with a drawn sword in his hand, to act for and in sympathy with, them. Thus, at all times, God and his Israel were together. While they toiled, he toiled, and until they could rest, he would not rest. But David desired to build a house, and find a resting place for God, while there were both enemies and evil a current. He desired to retire from the position and service of a man of war, and enter upon those of a man of rest. This could not be. It was contrary to the thoughts and counsels of the God of Israel. It came to pass that night, that the word of the Lord came to Nathan, saying, Go and tell my servant David, Thus says the Lord, Shalt thou build me a house for me to dwell in? Whereas I have not dwelt in any house since the time that I brought up the children of Israel out of Egypt, even to this day, but have walked in a tent and in a tabernacle. The Lord would not allow another son to rise without correcting the error of his servant. He sets before him his own past actings toward Israel and toward himself, he reminds David that he had never sought a house or a rest for himself, but had wandered up and down with his people in all their wanderings, and been afflicted in all their afflictions. In all the places wherein I have walked with all the children of Israel spake I a word with any of the tribes of Israel whom I commanded to feed my people Israel, saying, Why build ye not me a house of cedar? What lovely! What soul-stirring grace breathes in these words! The blessed God came down to be a traveller with his travelling people. He would set his foot on the sand of the desert, because Israel was there, he caused his glory to dwell beneath the covering of badgers' skins, because his redeemed ones were in militant circumstances. 
Jehovah sought not a house of cedar, it was not for that he had come down to visit his people in the hour of their affliction in Egypt, he had come down to give, not to take, to dispense and minister to his people, not to exact from them. True, when the people had put themselves under a covenant of works, at Mount Horeb, God had to test them by a ministration which was characterized by the words, do and give, but had they only walked in the power of God's original covenant with Abraham, they would never have heard such words uttered in connection with the terrific thunders of Mount Sinai. When God came down to redeem them out of the hand of Pharaoh, and out of the house of bondage, when he bore them on eagles' wings, and brought them to himself, when he made a way through the sea for his ransom to pass over, and overwhelmed the hosts of Egypt in the depths, when he showered down manna from heaven, and caused the refreshing stream to gush from the rock, when he took his place in the pillar of fire by night, and the pillar of cloud by day, to guide them through the trackless desert, when he did all these things for them, and many more, surely it was not on the ground of anything they could give or do, but simply on the ground of his own everlasting love, and the covenant of grace made with Abraham. Yes, this was the ground of his acting toward them. What they did was to reject his grace, trample on his laws, despise his warnings, refuse his mercies, stone his prophets, crucify his son, resist his spirit. Such were their actings, from the beginning, the bitter fruits of which they are now reaping, and shall reap, until they are brought, humbly and thankfully, to bow to his covenant of grace. By bringing all these past ways of God in review before David, the Lord taught David his mistake in seeking to build him a house. Shalt thou build me a house? Whereas, now, therefore, so shalt thou say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took thee from the sheep cut, from following the sheep, to be ruler over my people, over Israel, and I was with thee whithersoever thou wentest, and have cut off thine enemies out of thy sight and have made thee a great name, like to the name of the great that are in the earth. Moreover, I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and will plant them, that they may dwell in a place of their own, and move no more, neither shall the children of wickedness afflict them any more, as before time, and as since the time that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel, and have caused thee to rest from all thine enemies. Also the Lord tells thee that he will make thee a house. David is here taught that his own history, like that of his people, was to be a history of grace from first to last. He is conducted, in thought, from the sheep coat to the throne, and from the throne into the ages of the future, and sees the whole course marked by the actings of sovereign grace. Grace had taken him up, grace had set him on the throne, grace had subdued his enemies, grace was to bear him onward, grace was to build up his throne and his house to all generations it was all grace. David might justly feel that the Lord had done much for him, the house of cedar was a great thing for the shepherd of Bethlehem, but what was it when compared with the future? What was all that God had done, compared with what he would do? When thy days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom he shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Thus we see, that it was not merely his own short span of forty years that was to be characterized by such actings of grace, his house too was spoken of for a great while to come, even forever. To whom, think you, are we directed in all these promises made to David? Are we to regard them as fully actualized in the reign of Solomon? Surely not. Glorious as was the reign of that monarch, it by no means corresponded to the bright picture presented to David. It was, in one sense, but a passing moment, during which a bright gleam of sunshine flashed across Israel's horizon, for hardly are we conducted to the lofty pinnacle on which Solomon was elevated, when the chilling words fall on the ear, but Solomon loved many strange women, etc. Hardly has the cup of exquisite delight been raised to the lips than it is dashed to the ground, and the disappointed heart cries out, Vanity of vanities, all is vanity and vexation of spirit. The book of Ecclesiastes will tell us how far short the reign of Solomon came of actualizing the magnificent promises made to David in this seventh chapter of 2 Samuel. In that book we trace the yearnings of a heart that felt an aching void, and was ranging through creation's wide domain in search of a satisfying object, but ranged in vain. We must, 
therefore, look beyond the reign of Solomon to a greater than he, even to him of whom the Spirit in Zacharias speaks in that fine prophecy in Luke 1, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people, and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began, that we should be saved from our enemies, and from the hand of all that hate us, to perform the mercy promised to our fathers, and to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he sware to our father Abraham. Again, in the angel's address to Mary, Behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God shall give to him the throne of his father David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Here the heart can repose without a single check. There is no doubt, no hesitation, no interruption, no exception. We feel that we have beneath our feet a solid rock, the rock of ages, and that we are not, like the writer of Ecclesiastes, constrained to lament the absence of an object capable of filling our hearts, and satisfying our desires, but rather, as someone has observed, like the bride in Canticles, to confess our entire lack of capacity to enjoy the glorious object presented to us, who is the fairest among ten thousand, and altogether lovely. Of his kingdom there shall be no end. The foundations of his throne are laid in the deep recesses of eternity, the stamp of immortality is upon his scepter, and of incorruptibility upon his crown. There shall be no Jeroboam then, to seize upon ten parts of the kingdom, it shall be one undivided whole forever, beneath the peaceful sway of him who is meek and lowly in heart. Such are God's promises to the house of his servant David. Well might the astonished recipient of such mercies, when speaking of all that had been done for him, exclaim, and this was yet a small thing in thy sight, O Lord God. What was the past when compared with the future? Grace shone in the past, but glory glistened in the future. The Lord will give grace and glory. Grace lays the foundation, glory garnishes the superstructure. This is true of all, it is true, in an eminent degree, of the church, as we learn from the epistle to the Ephesians. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in the heavenlies in Christ, according as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. To the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he has made us accepted in the beloved, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, we should be to the praise of his glory, and again, but God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, has quickened us together with Christ, by grace ye are saved, and has raised us up together, and made us sit together in the heavenlies in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. Here we have grace and glory set forth most blessedly, grace securing, on immutable principles, the full forgiveness of sins through the precious blood of Christ, and full acceptance in his beloved person, glory in the distance, gilding with its immortal beams the ages to come. Thus it is that the word of God addresses itself to two great principles in the soul of the believer, viz, faith and hope. Faith reposes upon the past, hope anticipates the future, faith leans upon God's work already accomplished, hope looks forward with earnest desire to his actings yet to be developed. This puts the Christian into a deeply interesting position, it shuts him up to God in everything. As to the past, he leans on the cross, as to the present, he is sustained and comforted by Christ's priesthood and promises, and as to the future, he rejoices in hope of the glory of God. But let us inquire what was the effect produced upon David by all this burst of grace and glory on his spirit? One thing is certain, it effectually corrected his mistake in seeking, as another has said, to exchange the sword for the trowel. It made him really feel his own thorough littleness, and the greatness of God in his counsels and actings. Then went King David in, and sat before the Lord, and he said, Who am I, O Lord God? It is impossible to convey, in human language, the deep experience of David's soul, as expressed in his attitude and inquiry on this occasion. First, as to his attitude, he sat. This gives us the idea of the most complete repose in God, without a single intervening cloud. 
there is no doubt, no suspicion, no hesitancy. God, as the almighty and gracious actor, filled his soul's vision, and hence, to have entertained a doubt would be calling in question either God's willingness or ability to do all that he had said. How could he doubt? Impossible. The record of the past furnished too many substantial arguments in proof of both the will and ability of God to admit of a doubt on the subject. And truly blessed it is thus to realize our place before the Lord, to allow the heart to dwell upon his wondrous ways of grace, to sit in his presence in the full, unclouded sense of his pardoning love. True, it is hard to understand why it should be so, why he should set his love on creatures such as we. Yet so it is, and we have only to believe and rejoice. But observe his inquiry, who am I? Here we have the hiding of self. David felt that God was all, and self nothing, when he sat before the Lord. He no longer speaks of his actings, his house of cedar, his plan of building a house, etc. No, he expatiates on the actings of God, and his own little doings sink into their proper nothingness in his estimation. The Lord had said, Shalt thou build me a house? And again, the Lord tells thee that he will make thee a house. In other words, the Lord taught David that he should be superior in everything, and that he could not, therefore, be anticipated in building a house. This might seem an easy lesson, but all who know anything of their own proud, self-righteous hearts, know that it was far otherwise. Abraham, David, Job, Paul, and Peter experienced the difficulty of hiding self and exalting God. This is, in fact, the most difficult lesson for a man to learn, for our whole being since the fall is set upon the very opposite, viz., the exaltation of self, and the setting aside of God. It is needless to adduce any proofs of this, scripture and experience alike demonstrate the fact that man seeks to be somewhat, and this cannot be attempted without setting aside the claims of God. Grace, however, reverses the matter, and makes man nothing, and God everything. Is this the manner of man? No, indeed, it is not the manner or law of man, but it is the manner of God. Man's manner is to set himself up, to rejoice in the works of his own hands, to walk in the sparks of his own kindling, God's manner, on the contrary, is to turn man away from himself, to teach him to look upon his own righteousness as filthy rags, to loathe and abhor himself, and repent in dust and ashes, and cling to Christ, as the shipwrecked mariner clings to the rock. Thus was it with David when he sat before the Lord, and, losing sight of himself, allowed his soul to go out in holy adoration of God and his ways. This is true worship, and is the very reverse of human religiousness. The former is the acknowledgement of God by the energy of faith, the latter is the setting up of man in the spirit of legalism. No doubt, David would have appeared, to many, a more devoted man when seeking to build a house for the Lord than when sitting in his presence. In the one case, he was trying to do something, in the other, he was apparently doing nothing. Like the two sisters at Bethany, of whom one would seem, in the judgment of nature, to have been doing all the work, and the other to have been sitting idle. How different are God's thoughts! David sitting before the Lord was in a right position, rather than seeking to build. It must, however, be observed, that while grace leads us away from our own actings, it does not hinder real acting for God. Far otherwise. It only hinders self-importance. It does not abolish service, it only puts it in its right place. Hence, when David learnt that he was not the man, nor his the time to lay aside the sword and take up the trowel, how readily did he acquiesce? How readily did he draw forth his sword from its scabbard, and take his place once more on the field of battle? How ready was he to be the militant servant to the end, and allow the curtain to drop upon him as builder? How ready was he to retire, and allow another to do the work? In 2 Sam. 8 we find David smiting, slaying, taking, and thus earning for himself a still more extensive fame as a man of war, and proving how effectually he had learned the Lord's lesson. Thus will it ever be with all who have learned in the school of God. It matters little what the character of service may be, whether building the house, or subduing the foes of the Lord. The true servant is ready for anything. David came forth from amid the holy repose of the Lord's house to fight the Lord's battles, in order that he might clear the ground for another to lay the foundation of that house, which his heart had so fondly desired to build. 
Thus David was the servant throughout. In the sheepfold, in the valley of Allah, in the house of Saul, on the throne of Israel, he maintained the character of a servant. But we must pass to other scenes, in order to learn other and deeper principles in reference to David's connection with the house of God. He had to learn, in a remarkable manner, where the foundation of the Lord's house was to be laid. Let the reader turn to 1 Chronicles 21 and read it. It is parallel with 2 Samuel 24, and furnishes the account of David's fall in numbering the people. He became proud of his hosts, or rather the Lord's hosts, which he would fain regard as his. He desired to count his resources, and, alas! He had to learn the emptiness thereof. The sword of the destroying angel mowed down seventy thousand of his boasted numbers, and brought home to his conscience, in terrible solemnity, his grievous sin in attempting to number the Lord's people. However, it had the effect of eliciting much of the sweet, self renouncing grace that was in David. Hear his touching words, as he exposes his own bosom to the stroke of judgment, and David said to God, Is it not I that commanded the people to be numbered? Even I it is that have sinned and done evil indeed, but as for these sheep, what have they done? Let thy hand, I pray thee, O Lord my God, be on me, and on my father's house, but not on thy people, that they should be plagued. This was precious grace. He learned to say, thy people, and was ready to stand between them and the foe. But there was mercy in the midst of wrath. By the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite, the angel of judgment sheathed his sword. Then the angel of the Lord commanded Gad to say to David, that David should go up, and set up an altar to the Lord in the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite. Here, then, was the place where mercy triumphed, and caused her voice to be heard above the roar of judgment. Here the blood of the victim flowed, and here the foundation of the Lord's house was laid. At that time, when David saw that the Lord had answered him in the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite, then he sacrificed there. For the tabernacle of the Lord, which Moses made in the wilderness, and the altar of the burnt offering, were at that season in the high place of Gibeon, but David could not go before it to inquire of God, for he was afraid, because of the sword of the angel of the Lord. Then David said, This is the house of the Lord God, and this is the altar of the burnt offering for Israel. And David commanded to gather together the strangers that were in the land of Israel, and he set masons to hew wrought stones to build the house of God. Blessed discovery. Thus impressively and solemnly, and effectually, was David taught the place where the Lord's house should be built, and its deep significance. The Lord knows how to lead his people, and to instruct them in the deep secrets of his mind. He taught his servant David by the instrumentality of judgment first, and mercy afterwards, and thus led him to the place and its meaning where he would have his temple built. It was by his necessities he learnt about the temple to God, and he went forth to make preparation for it as one who had learnt God's character by his own deep failure. This is the house of the Lord God, the place where mercy rejoiced against judgment, the place where the blood of the victim flowed, the place where David had his sin blotted out. This was very different from going to build on the ground of his dwelling in a house of cedar, as in 2 Samuel 7. Instead of saying, Lo, I dwell in a house of cedar, he might say, Lo, I am a poor, pardoned sinner. It is one thing to act on the ground of what we are, and quite another thing to act on the ground of what God is. The house of God must ever be the witness of his mercy, and this holds good whether we look at the temple of old or the church now. Both show forth the triumph of mercy over judgment. At the cross we behold the stroke of justice falling upon the spotless victim, and then the Holy Ghost came down to gather men around the person of him who was raised from the dead. Just as David began to gather the hewed stones, and the materials for the joinings of the house, the moment the place of the foundation was settled. The church is the temple of the living God, of which Christ is the chief cornerstone. The materials for this building were all provided, and the place of its foundation purchased, in the season of Christ's trouble. For David represents Christ in his sufferings, as Solomon represents him in his glory. David was the man of war, Solomon, the man of rest. David had to grapple with enemies, Solomon was able to say, There is neither enemy nor evil occurrent. Thus do these two kings shadow forth him who, by his cross and passion, 
made ample provision for the building of the temple which shall be manifested in divine order and perfectness in the day of his coming glory. David proved, in the end, that though his thoughts as to the time of building the house needed to be corrected, his affection for the house itself was not the less fervent. He says, At the close, now I have prepared with all my might for the house of my God, the gold for things to be made of gold, and the silver for things of silver, and the brass for things of brass, the iron for things of iron, and wood for things of wood, onyx stones, and stones to be set, glistening stones and of divers colors, and all manner of precious stones, and marble stones in abundance. 1 Chronicles 29-2 In 2 Samuel 24-24, we read, in reference to the site on which the temple was built, so David bought the threshing floor and the oxen for fifty shekels of silver. And in 1 Chronicles 21-25, we read, so David gave to Ornan for the place six hundred shekels of gold by weight. The comparison of the two passages, so far from presenting any discrepancy, unfolds divine beauty. Righteousness valued the place at the former amount, whereas grace gave the latter. David had set his affections to the house of God, and therefore gave over and above. This very simple and very beautiful. In Samuel, only the threshing floor and the oxen for sacrifice at the time of the plague are mentioned, while in Chronicles the place, the whole temple hill, seems to be comprehended. Thus does grace put service into its proper place, and not only so, but imparts an energy to it which ill-timed service can never exhibit. David had learnt lessons when he sat in the Lord's presence, and when he stood on the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite, which wonderfully fitted him for making the needed preparations for the temple. He could now say, I have prepared with all my might. And again, because I have set my affection to the house of my God, I have of my own proper good, of gold and silver, which I had given to the house of my God, over and above all that I have prepared for the holy house, even three thousand talents of gold, etc. His strength and affection were both devoted to a work which was to be brought to maturity by another. Grace enables a man to hide himself and make God his object. When David's eye rested on the glittering pile which his devoted heart had raised, he was able to say, Of thine own have we given thee. Blessed be thou, Lord God of Israel our Father, for ever and ever. Thine, O Lord, is the greatness, and the power, and the glory, and the victory, and the majesty, for all that is in the heaven and in the earth is thine, thine is the kingdom, O Lord, and thou art exalted as head above all. Both riches and honor come of thee, and thou reignest over all, and in thy hand is power and might, and in thy hand it is to make great, and to give strength to all. Now, therefore, our God, we thank thee, and praise thy glorious name. But who am I, and what is my people, that we should be able to offer so willingly after this sort? For all things come of thee, and of thine own have we given thee. For we are strangers before thee, and sojourners, as were all our fathers, our days on the earth are as a shadow, and there is none abiding. O Lord our God, all this store that we have prepared to build thee a house for thy holy name, comes of thy hand, and is all thine own. Who am I? What a question! David was nothing, and God was all and in all. If ever he had entertained the thought that he could offer anything to God, he entertained it no longer. It was all the Lord's, and he, in his grace, had allowed them to offer it all. Men could never make God his debtor, though he is ever seeking to do so. The fiftieth psalm, the first of Isaiah, and the seventeenth of Acts, all prove that the unceasing effort of man whether Jew or Gentile, is to give something to God, but it is a vain effort. The reply to man, thus endeavoring to make God his debtor, is, if I were hungry, I would not tell thee. God must be the giver, man the receiver. Who, says the apostle, has first given to him. The Lord will graciously take from those who are taught to say, Of thine own have we given thee, but eternity will declare God to be the great first giver. Blessed that it should be so. Blessed for the poor, guilty, broken-hearted sinner, to recognize in God the giver of all, of life, pardon, peace, holiness, everlasting glory. Happy was it for David, as he drew near the end of his checkered career, to hide both himself and his offerings behind the rich abundance of divine grace. Happy for him to know, as he handed the plan of the temple to Solomon, 
his son, that it should ever be the monument of God's triumphant mercy. The house was, in due time, to rise in magnificence and splendor from its foundation. The effulgence of divine glory was yet to fill it from end to end, yet would it never be forgotten that it stood on that sacred spot where the devastating progress of judgment had been stayed by the hand of sovereign mercy, acting in connection with the blood of a spotless victim. And in passing from the temple of Solomon to that which in the latter day shall arise in the midst of God's beloved people, how fully may we trace the development of the same heavenly principles. Still more, when we pass from the earthly to the heavenly temple, may we behold the glorious triumph of mercy over every barrier, yea, rather, the glorious harmony effected between mercy and truth, righteousness and peace. From amid the brightness of millennial glory, shall Israel below, and the church above, look backward to the cross as the place where justice sheathed its sword, and the hand of mercy began to erect that superstructure which shall shine, with everlasting light and glory, to the praise and honor of God, the blessed giver of all.